Hello and welcome to Production Guild's live webinar this evening. My name is Lawrence Sargent, uh, Director of Sargent Disc, and I'd like to welcome um, the members here tonight at Warner Brothers Delane Lee in Soho and those of you who are watching live uh, on YouTube. For non-members and those new to the Production Guild, it is the UK's most prestigious membership organisation for those working in film and television production, particularly in drama. And Production Guild's 800 members are the most experienced and well-respected professionals working in production accounts, production office, assistant directing, location management, post-production and VFX. If you'd like to find out more about the Production Guild and how they can support your production or help you in your career, um, then go to www.productionguild.com. Uh, and the video on the home page is members and how the Production Guild supports their work in UK film and television industry. Um, so Sergeant Disc, which is where I work, um, we're proud to be a business partner for the Production Guild and also to be supporting today's event. Over the last 30 years, we've worked on a large number of productions and provided tools to help in putting together a finance package and also to keep people on budget. Uh, fortunately, we don't have to do the hard work and go out and raise the finance. Um, there are lots of producers working very hard to do that. Um, and we hope that today's session will be of use to any of you out there trying to do the same. Before I introduce today's distinguished panel, I'd like to thank Microsoft for supporting this event. And I'm pleased to announce that the guests in the room tonight will have a chance to win a Surface Pro 3 uh, or a Lumia phone um, in a raffle. So at home, unfortunately, you're missing out, but um, we'll let you know who won. Uh, following the seminar, there'll be drinks in the bar and Microsoft will be on hand to discuss uh, the clearance options on their products for your productions. Um, if you are watching live and you have any questions about raising finance for film and TV drama production, Please send in your questions via the YouTube chat box for this stream or through Twitter by using the hashtag <coughs> PGRaisingFinance. That's all one word. Uh, these questions will be fed to me by Alison here in the front row um, during the webinar. And if you're unable to watch the whole seminar live, the video will be archived and shown on the Production Guild's YouTube channel after the stream has ended. So moving on, um, today's distinguished panel have first-hand experience of, fund of the fundraising process and bring with them a detailed knowledge of many different sources of finance. And the goal of today's session is to give them a platform um, via which they can share their insights and strategies as we look at the full range of funding available for film and television in the UK. So first on my left, I have Ali Moshrif, the production executive at Film Finances. Um, for those of you who don't know, Film Finances is, is an independent completion bond company specialising in providing assurances to financiers to ensure the successful and timely delivery of films. And before joining Film Finances, Ali trained and worked as a production accountant. Um, next to him we have Cassandra Sigsgaard, who is a producer of Jiva Films. And Cassandra set up Jiva Films in 2008 to produce her own slate of feature productions and most recently working with the Blaine brothers on the short film, Nina Forever. Feature film. Uh, short feature film, thank you. I did say <laughs> correct me if I get it wrong, and, uh, and grammatical corrections as well. Um, next, to, uh, next to Cassandra, we have Pauline Burt, the CEO of Film Cymru in Wales. And the film agency in Wales is the main feature film body for Wales, providing finance, information and advice to the industry. And Pauline can tell us more about what, what they do um, as we go through um, the questions. Um, next to Pauline, uh, we have Nick Hirschkorn, who's the executive producer and MD of Feel Films. And Nick is a successful producer who recently brought little magic to our screens with the popular high-end TV drama Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. And finally, we have Chris Smith, a managing partner at Rommel Swire. And the Rommel Swire Group is a commercial <coughs> consultancy who, via their offices in London and New York, deliver projects spanning licensing and product development, film financing and product placement, endorsement and sponsorship, personal public relations and personal management. So I'm sure there are... No corrections from my side. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd like to start with looking at film financing and the, in particular the financing of independent films. And the last few years have been an exciting period for UK film and television and according to BFI, statistics, the total uh, UK film production activity in 2014 was up 35% at a record £1,475,000,000. So Ali, um, <laughs> at Film Finances you see a whole variety of productions going through. 
Do these figures tell the whole story and are they representative of the independent film producer and what they're experiencing at the moment? Um, well, we don't do statistics per se where we are, so I, I can only go on what we see. It's kind of anecdotal. We're involved in, I suppose, 50 films, also independent films, just from the UK office, and that covers most of Europe. Um, and uh, it's, I think it's very hard, harder than those figures might suggest for independent producers to raise financing because it's, uh, again, just anecdotally, we come out of meetings and you see, a, you see an enthusiastic producer with their budget and their plan and their production and their fees really are minimal sometimes and you think, why, why are they doing this? So it's, it's difficult for them. Uh, and, and we see that the financing, finance plans and all these films are very different, very diverse. There's new people that come into the market, people leaving the market. So whereas maybe five to ten years ago, I speculate there was more of a, uh, a temp template that people followed, although I can't say that for sure. Now it's, it, they're all very diverse, very different. So that's the biggest trend, I think, is that they're all different from each other, the finance plans. There's no set um, template. Would you say there are any particular trends that you're seeing at all? I mean, the diversity is there, but are there areas well, you, of finance that... Um, you see some high net worth individuals, or new equity investors that you wouldn't, that are new to the market that don't have experience in film. And for some reason, they are being attracted to it. Perhaps it's some of the tax incentives or the uh, EIS schemes, but there are more of those now than I would say there were four or five years ago. They do... Um, yeah, we see new entries, I suppose, from that angle. And in terms of perhaps co-production or tax relief, are you seeing people looking further afield and, and co-producing? Yeah. And you talked about shooting across the whole of Europe, but are yeah, people, people are having to, to make... look at people are having to look at discretionary funds. They're going to um, three or four countries, trying to shoot according to be able to get the right rebates in each region. So you know, turning their film into a road movie, even though it isn't necessarily a road movie, but for economic reasons as opposed to creative reasons, or trying to marry those two. So yeah, people are having to go hard f after the money. Okay. Um, Cassandra, to move on and, and talk a little bit about how you put together your strategy for, for financing Nina Forever. Um, what sort of approach did you take? It sounds like it can be complicated out there when you're looking to structure this from the outset. <coughs> yeah, um, it's uh, a first feature for uh, Chris and Ben Blaine, the Blaine brothers, who I was working with, and also for me. So the strategy that we employed was um, to go out there and raise um, just pure equity, basically. Um, we have had support from the industry previously, but with this film, which is a very unique um, story about a young woman who falls in love with a guy whose previous girlfriend died in a car crash, and every time they make love, she comes back from the dead, bloody and broken like the day she died. It's quite an unusual story. Um, and we chose to therefore um, uh, seek private equity so that we could retain the Blaine's um, vision for the film, really, um, mm -hmm. to, to the best of our abilities within a, a limited, therefore, budget. Um, and um, the, uh, the vehicle that we used was um, an SEIS. Um, so for anyone about SEIS, it's the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme, uh, which was set up to uh, support uh, and encourage investment uh, in uh, startup companies. And it can apply to uh, film production as well. And, and bigger films will use it as, a, as the first um, level of tax relief for investors before they then um, move on to an EIS, which is the uh, less attractive uh, from a tax point of view, um, but, uh, but can, you, know, you can raise more money through it, basically. Um, and so for us, it was quite interesting in terms of the investors who came on board. We had the two sort of cornerstone investors were both familiar with film and had invested in film before. Um, and then the rest of our investors were um, people who didn't really know much about the industry, but were excited by either the Blaines or by the film or just wanted to dabble and knew that they could afford to take a risk with a small chunk of, of money. Um, knowing that they were protected on the uh, on the downside, if you like, um, mm -hmm. with a very healthy tax relief. Um, 
in terms of tax relief, basically 50% uh, on your income tax, uh, you know, is, is the relief that you would get on your investment as long as you pay enough income tax to cover that. Um, so uh, it is extremely attractive. And then the other thing that we did was we started a, um, a Kickstarter campaign. So we also um, raised uh, crowdfunding. Um, which uh, was an interesting experience and actually very fruitful, um, not just in terms of raising additional finance, but also in terms of building an audience for the film who then were invested in the film and, um, and will be the ambassadors as the film rolls out. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Did you use uh, an, a bunch of IFAs uh, to sell the SEIS? Did you go via a company in order to bring those investors in or did you just set it up yourself with your own accountancy firm and then go out and find those investors yourself? Uh, I did the latter, um, partly because we weren't looking to raise that much money and partly because I had some contacts. So I was able to, uh, to pursue them. Um, with the film that I'm doing now, I'm looking at uh, talking to IFAs to see if we can raise bigger chunks of money with people that I don't have personal access to. But um, but it is interesting when you do talk to. I mean, I have got friends who are IFAs. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> um, no, and still uh, no, still friends. Ah. Still friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, um, and yeah, and, and actually in terms of uh, reaching the people that they represent, it can be quite awkward at times because, you know, film is still regarded by many as a, as a risky business, even with something as attractive as an SEIS or an EIS um, to, to help um, protect the downside. Mm -hmm. so. You talked about the private equity route and that being a way to keep creative control. What were the alternatives where you saw a downside or where you thought you may have to compromise? Was, you know, was there, a, yeah, was there a feeling that any particular source of finance might have meant mm, compromise on that? It's not, to be honest, maybe sort of retaining creative control isn't, wasn't the only motivating factor. It was also about speed. Mm -hmm. And, um, and for example, I, the, the script, Nina Forever, I received in early November. I gave some notes on the script. I loved it immediately, but there were some, some concerns with a couple of scenes and the boys went off and did a rewrite. I had it at the end of the November and we were filming end of March the following year. So that kind of speed is very hard to do with industry funding because the application process purely um, will take you a minimum of eight weeks, if not longer, and then you go through development and so on. So you, it's a longer game plan, really. Um, and we were young, hungry and just wanted to get on with it um, and had confidence in what we were doing. Um, in terms of creative control, the reason I said that, I suppose, is also that the Blaines have a very uh, particular voice in terms of their artistry. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's turned out to be the right strategy because um, allowing them to do the film the way they wanted to do it um, has meant that we are um, uh, now being courted by sales agents and distributors and industry money to support the next project. Yeah. I think the, the approach to use a um, crowdfunding platform, uh, that was Kickstarter, is that right? That's right. Um, I mean, it sounds like that also brought um, more interest from a, from a wider audience. Yeah, um, absolutely. And just sort of quickly, what sort of proportion of your budget were you able to sort of raise from that? Was it a significant amount or were you more no. interested in the promotional aspect of it? It was more the promotional aspect. It was it was for one specific scene that we raised the money and, um, and then to really build that audience to help us now when we're mm. um, about to go out um, into cinemas and so on. So, yeah. I was going to ask you how important getting the right talent attached to a project is, but it sounds like that's kind of fundamental to the success of this particular movie. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, budgeting your film at, at the right level for the kind of talent also that you, you're planning to be working with. So with, with writers and directors, if you're working with first timers, unless they have uh, the backing of, um, you know, a, a broadcaster or um, friends who are A-list stars, you probably want to keep your budgets reasonably low because of the talent that they can attract. Um, and uh, in terms of the acting talent, I mean, we were just incredibly lucky to find uh, an amazing cast who performed way above what anyone's expectations maybe should have been for a low budget film. Um, but, but yeah, talent is important. With my new film, we're, you know, having to attach talent that can attract the finance that can then set the whole sort of ship going, if you like, that Ali and everybody else here will be experienced with. So, Pauline, um, just to move on to you, in terms of the work that you do with Film Cymru in Wales, I mean, talent is one of the things that you support um, strongly. 
Um, what are the kind of uh, decision? What is the decision process really around um, discretionary funding? You know, how does a producer go about getting hold of that? And you know, are, are there differences between what you do in Wales as compared to what other regions of the UK are? Yeah, I mean, I think each public fund works differently and distinct, uh, distinctly. And we do co-finance quite often with other public funds. I mean, we've co-funded with the Irish Film Board, Creative England, Creative Scotland, um, Danish Film Institute, um, Film Evast, BFI, you name it. There's a lot of public funds that we'll co-fund with in the UK and beyond. Um, for us, we... Um, very much look to nurture Welsh talent, whether that's Welsh born or Welsh resident talent, and particularly writers, directors, producers, production companies. And so we prioritise projects that come through that have one or more of those elements in the mix. Um, we do occasionally look at projects that don't have an element like that. Uh, so Submarine, for example, um, didn't have any of those elements, but clearly um, it's a very Welsh project. It was uh, adapted from a Welsh book. We put a trainee Welsh producer on it, as it happened, um, and really kind of looked at that as, as a strategic opportunity. Um, and also Dark Horse is another project. That, in fact, those are the only two out of the 50 films that we've done so far um, that haven't had Welsh writers, directors or producers attached. Um, but we're quite flexible in other respects. So as long as the film can qualify as British, either through the cultural test or any of the treaties or the European co uh, Convention, you can shoot your film anywhere and it can be about anything. It doesn't have to be culturally identifiably Welsh. And clearly other public funds will not necessarily take that view, but it means that our fund is very flexible to be able to co-finance with the other projects, as I say, in Ireland, Denmark, Sweden, Australia, New Zealand, all over the place. Um, and about a third of our projects have been European co-productions. Um, so we try and find ways to be flexible in that respect. Um, and from a discretionary point of view, we're looking at the quality of the project, the viability of the project, and um, how it kind of fits the market for what it's trying to do. So we might do small projects of a quarter of a million up to about eight million pounds. Just a quick follow on from that, you talked about the um, shows co-producing and shooting more widely throughout Europe. Um, is there an emphasis on maximising tax credits and tax relief in those instances or is that in terms of the finance side or is it more um, a creative input? That the they co tend to be driven by creative decisions. Yeah, I mean I would always advise that anyway. I think if you if you put your project together being driven first by the money then that's probably not the right way to go about it. I mean sometimes you'll if you're looking for the final piece you might start to do that particularly around things like post-production um, if there's flexibility but I think if you start with creatively what makes sense for your project um, you know we've worked with Spanish directors for example and then it made sense to do a Spanish co-production in a particular circumstance then um, I think that's always a good strategy. Okay. Thank you. Um, Nick just to sort of expand on, on that another area of finance is pre-sales um, in your work in film, is that uh, something that you've uh, used successfully in your finance strategy, or <laughs> it, it, it has proven well, difficult? Well, it's, it's, I think, it's essential that you have some pre-sales because I think you've you've got to illustrate that whatever film or idea it is that you're putting together, this is past a certain limit. I think it's different to Cassandra's experience. Um, if you if you're making a film for millions of pounds or millions of dollars, um, <laughs> even if you don't have pre-sales, you'll need a sales agent who is prepared to put figures and numbers next to what he believes, or he or she believes, that that project will attract internationally. And you can't make a film without it. So you have to have that at least. Uh, ideally, if I was putting together a, a film project at the moment, you'd want to have a couple of, <clears throat> a couple of big territories pre-sold. Um, so that you could show that it had real value and then you want to have good estimates from the best sales agent that you can find um, for the rest of the world because then you're going to want to be getting uh, banking or gap finance based upon those figures. So if you don't have that, I think, and it's a, it's a more seriously budgeted or significantly budgeted film with actors in it uh, that are going to cost you some money, you're going to find it very difficult to make a film without it. So yes, it's essential. There's a, a, a lot being talked about at the moment with video on demand, Netflix, Amazon Prime and so on, um, and possibly that being another source of potential pre-sales for, for producers. 
Yeah, I think. I, I mean, I think absolutely the uh, the landscape is changing. There's no question about it. And Netflix and what they're doing is very interesting. There are a lot of people standing up in Cannes shouting about it, going, "Oh, they're going to ruin the industry!" Look, the fact is that the business is changing. We saw it happen with the music industry, um, you know, not that long ago, and it's going to be the same for the film business. And we've got to move with the times. Um, obviously, Netflix are trying to define at this moment in time, what they get for their money and maybe redefine the terms of, of what we've all believed to be the way that it functions, and that could well happen. Um, but I don't think any of us have had enough experience, certainly on the, the Netflix or Amazon side of things when it comes to feature film financing. Um, I, I heard that Brad Pitt recently got a, a $60 million picture picked up entirely and budgeted, uh, financed entirely by Netflix, which wasn't picked up by any of the studios. Um, and I think that's really interesting news. So surely we have to keep a very, very keen eye on how it's going to develop, but within television, um, you know, there there's a mag, you know, a huge force going on there, and we really have to take notice of it, and also the competitive nature of it. I think it's very healthy. Amazon, Google, you know, Netflix—they're all competing for the same talent. Thank you. Um, just to move on to another area of finance that uh, some people, um, producers, may not always consider. Um, but Chris, could you explain uh, how they might benefit from product placement and brand integration, and maybe explain what the difference between those two are? Yeah, something. of course. Um, I mean, firstly, I'd say that never use product placement as your sole form of financing, unless you're Morgan Spurlock <laughs> or someone like that. Um, I mean, there are. I think a lot of people look at product placement and brand integration, which I'll, I'll come on to in a second, as um, maybe something that, that's not, because they're un unfamiliar with it, it might not be the first thing that would pop into their head, but it can actually be a very very useful tool as part of that, that financing model. Um, the main differences that you'd come across between product placement and, and brand integration, product placement is uh, it's really seen in three separate ways. Uh, one is on a verbal basis, one's on a, a visual, and, and the third is on signage. And you tend to do deals with brands who are looking for a degree of exposure within a particular project, um, but generally, it's not always the case, but generally that's that's an unpaid partnership. Um, so there's a mutual benefit from both sides. The production get a specific product, which may go against their bottom line, um, and the brand get a, a degree of exposure, whether it's minutes or in a particular scene that's quite important within the film. So everyone walks away happy from, from that particular position. Um, it's, do it's done very, very well but by a number of different number of different um, studios and, and independent producers as well. Um, from a brand integration perspective, this is where you can get a little bit more creative and you can start to kind of intertwine uh, the brand within the story. So where the story can potentially, be, uh, sorry, the brand can potentially become a character in itself. So I'm thinking something like uh, the Audi R8 in the Iron Man series, which has become Tony Stark's car. Someone walks into a dealership, they want to drive Tony Stark's car. Or even going back to the late 90s to see the Matrix, the Nokia phone. Um, this isn't a plug, uh, honestly, it's not. Um, but it's such an iconic brand that was placed in that film that I think, it, it, well, certainly it, it had a huge spike in sales post that. Great. And I mean, at what stage in, the, in kind of putting together a, a project should a producer be considering this? Should they, and when would they come and talk to someone like yourself? Is it? A... Um, well, I think I think it should always be in the depending on the size of film. And I to to my, my colleagues up here earlier, sort of identifying that it's not always about the cash. It's not always about the investment side. Um, the creative still has to be paramount to any project, but I would say that the producer always needs to be thinking about that bottom line, whether it's getting free product, whether it's being able to commercialise something else that they have within the film. So they would probably be approaching a company like us about three to six months prior to filming taking place so that we have a good run to be able to, to create those opportunities. Great. Um, we're going to move on now and um, take a look a little bit in more detail at high-end television um, and how that whole model of finance compares with the independent film finance model. Um, as a bit of a kind of background to that, in the UK the introduction of the high-end uh, TV tax relief has actually helped push the amount spent on qualifying production up to 615 million in 2014. I'm quoting the BFI statistics again. Um, we're seeing new sources of um, funding coming into play with Netflix and Amazon we've talked about and possibly disrupting kind of the studio system for film and, and potentially bypassing the standard distribution channel for television. Um, Nick, you've gone down a relatively standard route in terms of what we've seen on, on the screen at home, but um, perhaps you could explain to us um, with a high-end drama like Jonathan Strange and, and Mr. Norrell um, what pieces need to fall into place and how you kind of went about structuring that 
particular project? Sure. Um, well, the, the landscape, I think, over the last 10 years has changed dramatically for financing um, high-end drama. And I think that, uh, you know, in the past, what would happen is that you would be cornerstoned, your investment, uh, your uh, financing would be cornerstoned with the broadcaster. They'd give you an amount that is set by the tariff as a, as a license fee for your show. And then what most producers would do is they would go off and they would attract uh, a sales company to maybe stump up another 10 or 15% or whatever it was, and they'd have to go off and make the show for that amount of money. Um, the reality now is that the appetite for television is for shows that cost a lot more than they used to cost, um, yet the tariff amounts have not escalated to pick up that slack. So instead, what's happened is that the producer has had to utilise independent film funding um, skill to come along and really double the amount, at least, of what the uh, of what the network is prepared to give you. And so, with that in mind, um, I found myself moving from having put together independent films uh, and then doing a sort of independent film and television fusion into doing something that was like Jonathan Strange, which is a classic television series that required a lot of thought that I would normally uh, have associated with independent film financing. So, we had to bring in a number of different partners. We uh, some people have said to me it's the most complicated financing plan they've ever seen. Um, there's a circuit diagram available to be seen by anybody that wants to see it. Um, but what we ended up doing is bringing in a number of partners. And, and, and the thing is, I think, the thing to say about financing is that you never really sure. There's, there's this sort of sense, well, we're going to sit down and write a plan and then we're going to go and find all the pieces that fit together. Well, it doesn't ever really work like that. It's, orga it's just as organic as developing uh, a show, in a sense. Um, you know, one of the things that I thought straight off the bat was, well, America's a big place. They've got loads of dosh. Um, we should go there. Because um, uh, you're seeing that cable shows are really having great success over there. Downton was doing very well. This is a long time ago. It's like three years ago when I started going around looking for, for cash. Um, and I should say I was not the only person who put the financing together on this. I had a couple of people who worked with me very closely, Justin Thompson-Glover and, and Patrick Irwin, who are bloody brilliant at the whole thing. Can I use bloody? Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, it's out. I said it twice. Uh, so so the, the point with that is that we did go uh, to America first, and I did go and pitch it around uh, Netflix and um, Showtime and HBO and all of those sorts of places. And... Uh, got a pretty lacklustre response. Um, even though it was a best-selling book, uh, I think that everybody felt, well, this is very British. They've all been entrusted to make more American-style shows. And so we didn't have anybody effectively really chomping at the bit at that point. Um, and so we realised at that point, because it could have been very straightforward, it could have been a UK broadcaster with a bit of maybe tax money and a sales company and North America. And that could have done all the financing and kept it very simple. Uh, the reality was that America didn't come in for a large chunk. And so we realised we'd have to find that large chunk somewhere else. And the decision was to do a Canadian UK co-production, um, which netted us you know, tax money in Canada. It also increases the sale that you can get from with a Canadian broadcaster. So all of those things combined meant that I was getting Canada together with the UK um, and then a whole load of other parties as well on top of that, plus the complication that it was co-production, which always makes things a little bit difficult. Was there an element of discretionary funding as well? Did you? Uh, when you say discretionary, what do you actually mean? I'm thinking, uh, we talked about it before, so I'll give it away. We're yeah. talking about uh, Screen Yorkshire. Is, did they get involved? Yes, in I mean, uh, uh, they did, um, and and they were brilliant. Uh, and did they have no choice? I, I use the word discretionary. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> they absolutely had a choice. Had a choice um, <laughs> but uh, but it was an interesting journey to go on. And you know, they don't have stacks of money. They have a good amount of money, but it's it's usually cut up between a few projects. Um, but yes, Screen Yorkshire were involved. Um, Endemol came on board for international sales. Ingenious were involved from an equity point of view and tax money as well. Um, and there were some other people. I'm probably going to really upset them by not mentioning them, but there were a lot of people. As a last question, just very quickly, I'll just say, did you use a completion guarantee on the project? God forbid, no. You didn't. So, <laughs> so that, that, that brings, sorry, me, Ali, that brings me back. Not that I've got any that problem me with back nicely. Did you need to, I guess, is the question. No, it's I, one of the great things about think, television yeah. is certainly it's not standard to have a completion guarantee. But I think we were talking before this, and Ali can uh, elucidate more on this, is that with some of the bigger American shows where they're really getting very, very large sums of money, I think that they're starting to require it more and more. But... It's, it's a great thing to not have if you can get away with it. 
So um, not to say that it's <laughs> I don't want to not to say that it's it's been very useful over the years I've done films. Yeah. I've had you know I haven't worked with film finances. I've worked, I worked with IFG before they closed, and and had very good experiences with them, and it worked really really well. But I think in television, uh, I don't know, I don't know how it would work, but I'm sure it does. That's a, my question to you, Ali, in right. terms of like what you're seeing and and whether you know in the high high end. It's well, starting to happen. You but know. It is, um, and it's all to do with risk, and the risk gets bigger when budgets get bigger, and there are new relationships and new financiers and new producers, and as you said, the appetite is so big for um, television production that you're getting lots of new um, relationships emerge between those characters, so the, the, it just increases oh, the risk somewhat, so that means that they are more likely to want someone like us who's guaranteeing that they're going to get their product at the end of it, which is essentially what we do for anybody who doesn't know. Um, yeah, so th that's the reason. The, the, ris the risk gets, worth, the risk gets bigger. I think as people who have been involved in independent film, i.e. equity players or discretionary funds or whoever it may be, move into the television space, they'll want to move into it with the comfort that they've had in the previous yeah, no realm of financing. And so I was constantly sort of trying to keep quiet about it, hoping that nobody would bring it up. No, and thankfully, yeah. nobody did. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Screen Yorkshire yeah. should be asking. And, and, and the bank, although, you know, Ingenious were effectively being the bank, they should be asking, but they weren't. So that was They're, good. It's not just the, um, well, I suppose the budgets are connected. Bonded films tend to be over a million um, pounds, more or less. And television production was probably below a million for an hour or a couple of hours. And now that's changing. You're getting things over, over two million, three million, I suppose, as you get into the uh, high-end um, Netflix, Amazon-type uh, mm -hmm. uh, content. So. Is the is the process similar? I mean, if you're going through the process uh, is actually bonding, is a mostly similar, apart from the fact that television is uh, we, we're we're coming to terms with with with, with this big ch difference that it has, and that it's written as it goes along somewhat, and that means that um, with a film true? with a script, you have a script, and you and you, you make sure that it's done with a with what you do when you have a television series that has they're not always written all up front. Some of them are, some of them aren't. So the key for us is to is is to have scripts, and if not, to somehow marry that up with with guaranteeing something that you don't have have. To describe it. <laughs> yeah. in, describe it in general have. terms. So it's uh, great, Chris. I'll, I'll jump back back to you now. Sure. Um, in terms of product placement, um, we see it a lot on on U.S. television in particular. Um, what sort of value might they you know be able to bring to to high end drama and and you know how again can you access that if you were looking to to do that as a producer? Well, I, I think it's got to be very clear that it's it's really only commercial channels that would actually use that as a additional source of, of revenue. And to be honest, if you're looking at the U.S. model, they they, they live and die by that because they're able to sell ad dollars um, around it, which is, is is kind of plucked in with uh, with product placement as well. So I mean, it's been for the past 60 years or 70 years, probably even longer actually, brands have been investing and in, in sponsoring um, soaps. That's where soaps actually, soap operas came from. It was the soap and detergent companies that used right. to actually sponsor those shows. Um, it's a, obviously a common phrase that we use nowadays. And I think the UK is slowly moving towards that, but I think we still have very much a, a perception of we don't want brands kind of anywhere near our shows. And we, we have this, so maybe it's a very British thing, I, I don't know, but it's it's, uh, Ofcom, who are the regulators in the UK, uh, changed the law in 2011, uh, where you're now allowed to have product placement in commercial-based shows or commercial-based channels. Um, but still, it's it's only really in the background. It's no one's really kind of taking full advantage of that. But again, it's it's down to brands, maybe in their agencies, advising them that that's maybe not the right audience for you. Can have to, has to be much about brand fit. But then you you look at platforms like. Amazon Prime and Netflix and Hulu, they're all fantastic opportunities for brands to get involved because there are no advertising mediums on mm. those platforms. So product placement and brand integration becomes so much more important to gain access into that audience because uh, whether all of us binge on Breaking Bad or Transparent, um, you might watch 10 shows in, in, in one setting or two settings. 
Um, and so you're, you're really captured by that particular story and, and that's where brands, I think, can have a much more, much more relevant role in, in that kind of creation of content. And in terms of generating interest in the show itself, um, I guess the brands will partner with the, the production company and... and... Yeah, I, it, it depends. I mean, that's all down to rights, to be perfectly honest. It's much more prevalent in, in movies than it is in, in television because you have a series that, that can run for six months on, on some networks or some channels um, and for a brand to continuously promote that particular show unless it's a, a sponsorship um, becomes quite challenging for them um, on a budget side. Great. Um, Cassandra, I'll come back to you. You've heard a little bit about the sort of television world. Um, your next show is going to be a, a bigger budget um, and so do you see any similarities with a sort of high-end television model and what you might do on your next project? And I maybe think you could yeah, I think particularly what Nick was saying about cobbling together lots of different sources of finance. That's what I'm doing at the moment on a bigger budget project uh, film. Um, so I, I do think there sounds like there are more similarities between television drama and, and independent film than I'd hoped, because I was kind of thinking I might ask you for a job. Um, <laughs> Out competing for the so, same. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, absolutely there are similarities. And, and the same obviously with the product placement and uh, brand integration, you know, that kind of has done very well in film and, and obviously is doing so in, in television as well. Would it be difficult for you as a producer to incorporate that cr creatively? I mean, depending on how you work and how you work with your um, um, Well, I partners. think, I mean, I, I, I have another company uh, where I do uh, clearances and product placement. Um, so um, I, I certainly notice that with film, um, you know, again, a little bit like uh, how I was talking about, you know, uh, protecting the creative vision of the directors I'm working with. I think there is also that sense within um, bigger films that, you know, you don't want to force your director to use a particular product just because they've said they'll give you, you know, 50 grand. Um, although sometimes you do want to do that, depending on, on the type of material that you're working on. And, um, you know, if it's period, then it's harder to place those products than uh, if it's modern day. So. Five million quid you can <laughs> <laughs> Coca-Cola uh, could Coca suddenly Cola appear. In the 1820s. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, at the Battle of Waterloo. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Pauline, um, just to sort of cap it off, really in terms of discretionary funds, um, are they available for television production, non-theatrical release, and, and you know, with, with your own programmes in Wales, um, are you able to support that kind of endeavour? Or are you... Well, we don't do television as a standalone, um, but we will look at um, other forms of IP around a film proposition, and we do that routinely, so every development proposition, every production proposition that comes into us, and it's relatively new, we've been testing it over the last 18 months or so, we'll look at all sorts of IP that might spin off of that, whether it's a game or a publication or it, TV adaptation, stage adaptation. Um, but uh, Pinewood Wales um, does do television as much as they do film, so there's, there's other funds there, Screen Yorkshire, as you mentioned earlier. Um, but it tends to obviously start with the commissioners, really, in the UK. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you've talked about going into other areas, intellectual property, and that's one evolution. Are there any other things going on out there? That... Uh, what, in terms of trends more generally that more, we're seeing? More generally, I think, in terms of just supporting the bigger picture and whether there's in developing talent and, and so yeah. on as well. I mean, I think I mean, there's various trends, I'd say. One of them is that we're seeing it's harder, and I think this is partly because it's so good on television at the moment, to get straight drama from a theatrical film point of view off the ground. Um, so we're seeing more um, of other forms of genre, more, and also docs and animation. Uh, so probably a strengthening in that area, more pre-sales available. But I think really the importance, and we try and do this wherever we can, are really great market materials, um, particularly if you've got something where you can show concept art, pilot scenes, tone, the interaction, chemistry of key characters um, can make a huge difference. And we found, you know, even investing relatively small amounts of money, like sort of 20k, 25k, um, can really help a sales agent secure pre-sales, can get equity comfortable, can get sales agents comfortable and can be a real driver to closing your finance. So seeing a lot of that is quite a powerful tool. Great. 
Um, I just want to remind everybody who's watching at home um, that if you are watching, you can post your questions on YouTube uh, in the comments box below the video player. And also you can tweet us at uh, PG Raise, Raising Finance. That's all one word. Um, we're going to move to some questions, I think, from the audience now, and then I'll come back to you all for a, perhaps a sort of hint or tip that you might offer. So if you want to give um, a little bit of thought to what you might advise uh, the next generation of producer to consider when raising their finance. Um, so maybe if we could go to the audience. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question from YouTube, Great. Um, which is, for someone who doesn't have any contacts with private investment, how do you, what's the best route? How do you go about trying to find private investors to invest in a project? Okay. So I'll repeat that um, from YouTube. If uh, you don't have contact with private investors, uh, how would you go about finding private equity and raising finance in that way? So maybe, um, Cassandra, I'll aim that one at you. If, uh, and maybe Nick. And Nick as well, <laughs> um, yeah, because you had them. So yeah. I don't know. Um, I think the thing really is to is to try and find those people. Um, <laughs> Are we back to our IFAs yeah. again? Is that the, well? I think IFAs absolutely, and and it's all actually. I, I'd say our business is so much about networking and getting yourself out there, and you just. Especially if you're making something, if you're fairly new and you're making something and you don't have a lot of, you know, contacts in the industry, A, get to know the industry because, you know, if they can back you, then that is an amazing thing. Um, but, uh, but also, you know, at a dinner party, mention it to, you know, your parents, your friends. You never know who suddenly turns around and goes, oh, I've always wanted to get involved in film and I've got 10,000, 20,000 to play with or, oh, I know somebody. So you, you start know, with so friends and family and then... <laughs> why not? <laughs> friends and family or as they, the, the model in, in the States used to be in the 70s, uh, dentists and doctors. Fantastic. You know. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, hopefully um, they I, remain. I so, would, yeah. uh, I'd say that's, that's a good way to start. I'd also think about... Uh, you don't necessarily have to go off and find those people individually. I think that there are a number of good organisations out there um, whose names I won't uh, mention directly here, but there are organisations that will go and find that money and raise those funds for you and are specialising in putting equity into those projects. So find out who those companies are um, and go and speak to them. And I think that you can also look at film credits and, and things like that just to see who are the sorts of companies that are involved on a regular basis on the sorts of films that you might be making. That's a really good idea. And then the, the third thing I would recommend is uh, get yourself a good lawyer, film lawyer, media lawyer, um, because uh, you know you don't have to spend a lot of money up front, but they will have seen a lot of deals going through and they might be able to point you in the direction of one or two or three people. And every time you have a meeting with somebody who you think is on the right track, make sure that you get three extra names out of it. That was a rule I've always used. And so you're effectively spidering out your contacts all the time. Right. Do we have any questions in the room otherwise from anybody? Or should we? Any more online? Um, there is another online question, which is, um, which is about how you find sales agents for different genre. You know, what's the best way of... So the question specifically is about a, a low-budget action thriller, but I think just generally anyway, the question, how do you find a sales agent who's going to be, you know, who either specialises in low-budget mm -hmm. or in, in different genre? Does it go to Cam or not? Sorry. Pauline, I'll let you answer that. That's an expensive way to go about <laughs> it. I mean, you can start with IMDb, which is a pretty good place to go for a kind of internet provider. I mean, it is really about research. Look at films that you think are good comparables um, from a budget point of view, from a, from a look, um, from how, um, how advanced the director is, etc., and then look at who sold sold those films and then around can without having to go to the market um, or of course genre specific markets like Fantasia is a, is a good one to look at um, have a look at the kind of product brochures the trade magazines they all do, they're all promoting they'll all show you the the main sales agents at the market and see what they're selling and there are other markets other than just Cannes. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, Cannes good because it's sunny. Um, but, <laughs> but Berlin, but is Berlin's a great yeah. one. It's a lot. Uh, it's it's quite close, and you can yeah. go there and quite quickly. Everybody sort of sets out their wares in quite a an easy way, and that is really the best way to find a sales agent is to go to a sales market and really sort of go around, look at the sales materials, as you say. I have a question for a budding producer and um, finding talent. I mean, we've talked about how critical it is to get the right people involved in your project. The money's almost secondary if you haven't got the project. Um, where do you, you know, is there a similar approach to going out and Are you talking about talent right? from an acting point of view? I would say talent from a writing point of view. Writing and directing and the development 
phase and, and obviously, I mean, casting is a key element of going out and raising mm. finance, I'd imagine, but... Well, it's not easy, <laughs> so I won't beat around the bush, but you've, you know, a lot of people might have developed relationships if they were at film school, for mm -hmm. example, with somebody who was a budding writer or they may know somebody, and that's how sort of, certainly quite a lot of stuff I was doing early on was working with people like that. Um, but make sure, I think we've all said, uh, producing is about networking. You've got to get out there, you've got to meet people, because if you don't, you won't be a producer. It's as simple as that. Um, and so make sure that you target the right people, get to know a couple of agents. Um, or even junior agents in agencies. Um, I've sort of grown up in the industry with certain people who've started at a junior level and they're now much more senior with all the leading agents in London. We've got a wonderful thing in England is that we've got fantastic talent. We've got great writing talent and they don't charge the same prices as America, which is brilliant. So um, you want to use that to your advantage and get to know those people. Um, there are only about five six real leading agencies and literally everybody's with one of those um, which also makes it a lot easier. Ali, just to, to you quickly, do you see the same people working as teams coming to you and is there less risk from your perspective when you see that kind of combination of um, producer director that's... Yeah, known, known quantity is, is less risk but um, do you, what do you mean by the same? Well, do people tend to stick together in the process and, and do you find that an easier um, a decision to make in terms of getting involved in a project when you've worked they, with the whole combination? Or? Too difficult to say. I think they do when, it's, when it works and when it doesn't then they never want to see each other again. So a bit of, bit Short, of both. Shortly. For, it, it, certainly for us it helps to, to uh, it's all about the team and the people if you know them and it, if you you're dealing with a director who you have, or a producer whose work you're familiar with and whose behaviour you're familiar with, then it helps to assess a project, um, which is what we do. But um, do we always see repeating teams? Mm, sometimes. Okay. Not sure. I have a question for Cassandra. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience of crowdfunding? Because everybody that I know who who has done it has said it's an incredible amount of hard work and an incredible commitment both before, during and long after. And I just wondered if you felt in terms of your experience to date whether it had been worth it. Could you just repeat the oh, question? Oh yeah, so the question was about crowdfunding and whether the fact that it's a labour intensive and uh, a lot of work to do, whether that's, uh, uh, if, if it's worth it. Um, I would say yes it is, uh, but probably as with nearly every other source of finance and any other endeavour you pursue, um, you need to evaluate what your project is and who your audience are um, and whether they would be the kinds of people who would be supporting a crowdfunding campaign. So for example I was talking to a uh, director who was um, doing a, a film on a um, Elvis impersonator and there are lots of Elvis fan clubs out there and Elvis impersonator fan clubs out there <laughs> um, but a lot of those fans are older and um, haven't kind of adopted um, using online payment systems and so they were expecting a huge pickup in uh, their Kickstarter campaign um, when in fact uh, they found that hardly anybody, in fact none of these people that they'd been courting for, for months and building this audience um, offline uh, wanted to put their credit card details online basically. Um, so, but, but the other thing I would say with a crowdsourcing campaign, if you're a producer you are already busy raising the rest of your finance or you're in production or you're in pre-production doing casting, heads of department, whatever it is that you're doing. And I would really recommend finding somebody who can run your um, crowdfunding campaign and allow yourself lots of time to plan because the more time you prep, the better the results. So, yeah. But surely the economic equation is really important as well. I mean, how much and you can potentially raise and what proportion that might be of your end budget. If it's 2%, it's probably not worth the, the time. But if it becomes 15 or 20%, then it really is worth the effort. I mean, yeah. the amount of effort that you put into getting other bits of finance, I can't imagine it's much harder. No, no. Well, I was it's also really not. interested in what you said about building an audience. And I wondered if when you were going, when you were then looking at sales agents, and particularly cinema distributors, 
where you use those statistics and said, look, we have got a pocket here and a pocket there, and then they would look at that and say, oh, well, that's five screens or that's a week. And, you know. Yeah, so the follow-on question was whether um, it's worth it from an audience building perspective. Um, I think the, uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, but again, it depends how successful your campaign has been. Um, sales agents and distributors are certainly interested to know whether there is already a fan base. I mean, if you've got, whether it be a, a crowdfunding campaign or you've had a really great um, uh, Twitter build up during production and so on, or if you've got a great Facebook page that, you know, is getting a thousands of likes, all of that helps. But at the end of the day, it's always going to be down to the product. Um, I think with, um, I think there is a new model coming basically, which is that uh, your crowdfunding can actually be pretty much the, the ticket buying process for an audience. So, you know, you could sort of offer once the film is done, you'll be the first to see it and you'll get an online screen, a link or whatever the thing is, you know, and it will be a way of bringing the cinema into your front room, for example. I think there's definitely a movement towards that, particularly at the sort of micro budget and the lower budget, uh, very indie sort of market. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, in our case, having ambassadors who will, you know, tweet about us and will follow through in terms of... Uh, what's happening with the film and encourage their friends to support the film that has been very helpful um i don't think it's why our sales agent chose us but, did you um, did you give out copies as it were of the of the end product yet. to the people that supported you or, um, or was it is it slightly um, more creative, shall we say, in terms uh, of what you're offering as what, your campaign? Well, yeah, we, we offered, I mean, you know, I sort of said that there is a dead a dead girlfriend in it with, uh, you know, who's bloody and broken. And so we had, uh, we had blood print mugs that were very popular. We had even uh, blood print um, pillowcases. Uh, randomly, um, somebody bought Snapped them for their, for their kids, <laughs> which I find a little bit uh, strange. But yes, actually, they were very popular. Um, so, uh, so we haven't given out the film yet, um, but that's also partly because we're still in the uh, festival. So we, we premiered at South by Southwest in America. Uh, in March and uh, we've got a festival coming up in the UK soon and in other markets um, so we're not quite at the stage where we will be sharing the film digitally with people but it's not far off and, and we will be giving portal, copies. Which portal did you use to raise the money? Was it an American portal or a UK portal? Kickstarter. It was Kickstarter. Yeah, right. so when and American. It's American, American, it's American right? but, it, um, but it launched in the UK just before we right, got onto that platform. Because there are different um, financial rulings, are there not, between the UK and America with regards to raising funds online? Not with regards to not with regards to this kind of fundraising. Right. Um, I think if it's equity investment, mm. you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> um, I have a question from you to follow on um, about crowdfunding. Which is it? So is it the case that if you offer copies of the films of the film to contributors, doesn't that have an effect on subsequent investors? Might they be concerned that you've already undercut some potential profits? <laughs> If so, okay, so yeah, you can. Yeah, I'll, I'll forget it now. Yeah. Um, it was just to say that if you've committed to giving out copies of the film, have you sort of undercut the, um, the, market, the market for and, your yeah, film? Yeah. Um, you would have to be extremely lucky to have, I, I hope, to have found that many investors on Kickstarter who would be buying a copy of your film um, to have completely depleted the rest of your um, sort of uh, route to, to money. Um, and if that's the case, then maybe that was your only source of finance or needed to be your only source of finance. Um, so no, I mean, if you're talking about between 500 and 1,000 backers, um, you know, unless your film really isn't very good, I hope you have more than 500 or 1,000 viewers. So, yeah. But the thing that I would say, what I've noticed, I've never done it myself, but what's interesting is the rules do seem to be changing because, as I'm sure everybody's aware, if you're doing a Kickstarter campaign, you have to be effectively giving them something in return for the money. Mm -hmm i.e. bloodstained mugs or pillowcases, <laughs> very creative, um, <laughs> excellent. Uh, so that's all great, but I think what's really interesting, and I was talking to Indiegogo just a few months ago in Cannes about the fact that their rulings, they anticipate them changing quite soon uh, in the States where one can actually raise physical equity in a film and therefore would be getting some back-end participation as opposed to Kickstarter where you're selling something and that's what they get and they get the excitement of being involved in the film. And I think that that 
has the potential to change the landscape of crowdfunding, where the amount of money that you might have raised from, say, a discretionary fund could come from, uh, you know, an equity investment plan Crowd online. investment is already is already happening. Is so there right. are other platforms, not Kickstarter or Indiegogo, right. that are already doing already crowd doing investment, it. and that's okay. for not just film but also for other uh, for other uh, products and so on. So, right. Yeah. Well, I'm, I think we, we might wrap it up there unless there's one last question from the from the room, if anybody has anything. Alison, any more online? Uh, nobody's talked about post-production and uh, people from post-production getting involved. So it's a really boring that's <laughs> 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 Post-production equity investment. Uh, yeah, I, I've been through that. Uh, I also happen to co-own a visual effects company called Milk um, that does all of Doctor Who and, and did all of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. And so I've analysed it in quite some de detail. Uh, the f I don't want to put the, the dampeners on it because it can work out to be really, really useful. I mean, it's, if, you're, if you're making a film and need that last piece and uh, one of the companies out there that can do equity investment alongside providing you services in kind is very, very useful. Um, but my general feeling is I always want to have the flexibility to go to the place that I want to do the post because there are certain places that do something that I really want out of them or it's the personnel. So I want that flexibility and... I'm always a little concerned that what I'm doing is effectively trading uh, an inflated cost um, for an equity investment as opposed to just getting a really damn good deal and going wherever I want to go. So that's my experience of it. Well, thank you all very much. I'm just going to wrap things up by going back down and, and asking each of you um, for that one key piece of advice you'd give to a producer that they should factor into their strategy for film or television. Um, financing. Me first. Ali, I'll um, start with you. Yeah. I, I think the, I would say don't underestimate how long it can take to close your financing even though you think you have your financing. Um, you will probably need to make some arrangement for cash flow in your pre-production because you will very rarely be able to close your financing before you have done a certain amount of work um, not just to do with production, but also to do with the financiers and the legals and lots of other things. And people only really start paying attention when that pre-production uh, period starts. So don't underestimate how long that takes and, and, and have a plan for how to get you through it to uh, further than you probably think you need to initially. <laughs> Okay. So, no, for film, I, I, you know, for stuff that we see, I don't know whether that's the same for everyone. No, it's a very, very good point. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think my top tip would be stay flexible and basically uh, roll with the punches. And I think it's kind Sounds of like reflects sport. what yeah, <laughs> bob and weave like a boxer. Um, I think it's a bit what Nick said earlier as well. It's, you know, you've got to be prepared that your finance might come from completely different sources to where you were expecting it at the beginning of the process. Mm. So stay flexible. Okay. Pauline? Yeah, all of that. Um, I think also, I mean, these things take such a long time to develop that always having very rounded conversations, whether it's with your talent about stuff that might come up at the future, you know, something that might just come from out of the blue that you weren't expecting and you go off in a different direction, end up doing a different project first. But also really think through what the value is in your project and it isn't necessarily just about the film how can you extend that value do you need to reserve some rights to protect that can you create sort of an extra equity space for yourself you spend a lot of time doing it so I think trying to really get as much value out of it as you can is really important uh, my tip is make sure you've got a bloody good idea um, I mean, all the financing mumbo jumbo, we can talk till the cows come home, but if you haven't got something fantastic, it's a bit of a waste of time. And I do see a lot of people, I know that sounds rather trite and simple to say, but you see a lot of people go, oh, I've got this great story about a guy who works in a chip shop and, you know, it's really exciting. He sees his mum in the evening and you're kind of going, look, nobody's going to watch it. So, and they'll spend four years sort of like plowing away and then ultimately sort of admit defeat and say it was somebody else's fault. Um, but the fact is, make your project irresistible because it's really competitive out there. There are people out there who are going to do whatever they can to get something financed. And the single most important thing is that you've got a project and a package and a collection of people that people look at and go, bloody hell, I really want to see that. And that's my biggest tip to any producer out there, because if you've got a brilliant project, you can hire somebody else to finance it. Um, my tip would be, if you are interested in the product placement or a brand integration side, 
and then get yourself a one pager. And on that one pager, you should include a very, very brief synopsis. I'm talking a paragraph. You should include who the key principals are. So director, producer, writer, um, any cast that you've actually tried to approach or that's uh, indeed locked in. Um, and then come up with a, a very simple concept of how you would want to work with that brand. Brands aren't difficult people to work with. They just want interesting ideas from creative people. Film and, and TV is a very aspirational area for brands to get involved in. Everyone's very, very keen to do it. It's just finding the right vehicle to be able to do that. Great. Well, thank you very much to the panel. Um, that was a fantastic uh, discussion. I'm sure you'll all agree, so if we can give them a, a round of applause. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you all for coming, and thank you to everybody who's been watching online. Um, I'd just like to thank our sponsors again, um, which uh, Microsoft, uh, who are going to be in the bar. Um, and <laughs> guests can experience the Microsoft. they are guests, <laughs> guests can experience the latest Microsoft devices, which include an Xbox One, uh, Lumia, and Surface Pro. Software such as Office, Skype, Bing, and Internet Explorer, which I'm sure you've all used. Um, and also they can discuss clearance options. Um, and we'll also be there from Sergeant Disc, so hopefully see you for a drink afterwards. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.